Good evening and welcome to Dearborn Christian Fellowship and to our Maundy Thursday worship service. We're so glad that each and every one of you have joined us this evening as we've gathered to worship the living God. Over the last several weeks, we've been making our way through a series entitled The Powerful Redeemer. And we've seen Jesus reveal all that his kingdom is about and himself as the true king. Tonight, we will see the most powerful act of Jesus' redemption, namely the saving of humanity through his death on a cross. And as we make our way to the cross, we will encounter the bitterness that Jesus encountered on his way there. But even so, we will see him heal, forgive, and redeem. And so come and join us as we worship the King. Who else commands all the hosts of heaven? Who else could make every king bow down? Who else can whisper in darkness trembles? Only a holy God. What other beauty demands such praises? What other splendor outshines the After sharing the Passover meal with his disciples, Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, knowing that the time for him to be betrayed and killed had arrived. Luke 22, 47 through 51. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, No more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then seizing Jesus, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Jesus 
Luke 23, 13 through 25. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. With one voice they cried out, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us! Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again. But they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third time he spoke to them, Why? What crime has this man committed? I found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. Love is this, oh my soul, oh my soul. What wondrous love is this, oh my soul. What wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of this to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. Sing. 
sinking down beneath God's righteous round. Christ laid aside his crown for my soul, for my soul. Christ laid aside his crown for my soul. The soldiers then led Jesus away into the palace, that is, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews. Again and again they struck him on the head with the staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. When I survey the wondrous cross On which the Prince of Glory my richest gain I count by loss and poor contempt on all my pride. See from his head, his hands, his feet, so. other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? He said. Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly for getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turned. My the chosen one, bring many sons to glory. The old the man upon a cross, my 
Welcome to a Maundy Thursday edition of worship here at Dearborn Christian Fellowship. I want to thank you for getting online and joining us tonight. We're continuing our series from Matthew called The Powerful Redeemer. And I'll be looking at a passage from Matthew 8 from verses 28 to 34. Please go ahead and get your Bible and start looking that up if you want to follow along. Remember that Matthew presents Jesus in his gospel. He presents Jesus as the king over his kingdom, the kingdom of God, and he's presenting this slowly but surely to us over the course of this book. Uh, In this series, we've already seen Jesus as the king over disease or health, a very timely message for us. We've also seen Jesus as the king over the natural world or his creation as he calmed the sea in our sermon this past Sunday. Tonight, I I wanna bring us to a point where we see Jesus as the king over the spirit world, especially over uh, the demon world. It's going to be, in many ways, it's going to be an, a proclamation of the gospel. And for a lot of us who have followed Christ for many years, we can look at the gospel proclamation as something that's not really something that's relevant to us. We've already taken care of that. We're already following Jesus. And yet, if we remember the lengths to which Jesus went, the things he was willing to do, it's refreshing and invigorating for us to remember what God has done. So I hope that's the experience for you tonight as we go through this. Maybe for some of you who are watching, you have never experienced this encounter with Jesus. You've never been redeemed from the one kingdom and brought into his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. And I'm gonna pray that tonight that will be your experience. Please, if you're able, uh, we like to have people stand out of reverence for the word. Uh, Please do that as I read God's inspired, holy, authoritative word to us tonight. Matthew 8, 28 to 34. When he arrived at the other side in the region of the Gadarenes, Two demon-possessed men came from the tombs and met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God, they shouted. Have you come to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. He said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town, and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. That's God's word to us. Let me pray. 
briefly before I start. Lord, we want to hear from you tonight. We love your word. We love how it changes us. Lord, I pray that through this message we would hear from you. We would hear your voice and your voice only. In Jesus' name, amen. On the surface, it may seem uh, like this passage has no connection to Maundy Thursday. You might be wondering why we're not reading about the Last Supper or about the Garden of Gethsemane or about the betrayal, and those are all good questions. Today's passage from Matthew fits the Maundy Thursday uh, theme in that Scripture paints a very dark and gloomy picture of that night, uh, the night of the Last Supper. We sense demonic activity and evil intentions all around the events and the occasions that night. We sense Satan and his minions doing their best to accomplish their goals. In fact, in Luke 22, verse 3, and in John 13, 27, we're told that Satan himself entered Judas at the Last Supper, at the table, right in front of Jesus. In the presence of the other disciples, in the presence of Jesus, Satan himself enters Judas for the... uh, activities of the evening. It probably seemed like a victory for them. It probably seemed like things were headed in the right direction. And as we read it, we could be fooled into thinking that. Just like today's story probably felt like a victory uh, in many respects for the demons and for Satan himself, uh, until Jesus shows up, until Jesus enters the picture. Mark and Luke tell the same story. They have different emphasis. They have different details. In fact, they have significantly more details in their stories. But they've got a different mindset as they approach this story. Matthew, again, is focusing on the kingdom. He's focusing on the battle of kingdoms, kingdoms that are fighting each other. And the individual players are not as important as the overall battle. We might liken it to a look at Um, we might liken it to look at the Battle of Normandy in World War II, whereas Matthew's looking at the entirety of the whole beach and the whole battle that took place and the Allied victory over the Germans, Mark and Luke are looking at a certain segment of the beach and looking at the action that takes place there and how these soldiers defeat those soldiers. And so we need to understand that in Matthew, it's more about the kingdom battle. We tend to think about kingdom battles and we think of two equal and opposite kingdoms at war. World War II was like that. We had two fairly equal and opposite uh, forces fighting each other and finally one was victorious. But we look at it and we say a different decision here, uh, not making a mistake here and, and maybe the outcome could be different. This is a different kind of battle. This would be more like the Kansas City Chiefs, the Super Bowl winning Kansas City Chiefs playing football against the worst collection of peewee football players in the history of our country. What chance would you give this peewee football? They don't even know how to throw the ball or catch it. And to make it, to make it more similar, we got to let the Chiefs have double the number of players. Okay, so they get 22 players. And they can score in either end zone. They can pass the ball to whoever, whenever. They can do anything they want. And they don't have to give the ball back after they score. Now, what chance does this peewee football team have? There is no chance, right? There aren't enough zeros to calculate that chance. And that's more like the battle of these two kingdoms. The power of Jesus' kingdom is that much greater than the power of the evil one's kingdom. The demons indicate that in this story. Jesus shows up and they say, what do you want with us, son of God? They know who they're talking to. They know who this man is. They recognize God himself in flesh walking onto the scene. We know from Mark and Luke that there's probably thousands of demons here. They call themselves legion for a reason. Thousands against one, and they're afraid. They know the outcome. In fact, they say it. 
have you come to torture us before the appointed time? They know there's a time coming. Their condemnation is certain, and they know it's waiting for them out there. Their time of relative freedom will come to an end, but they don't think it should be now. And so even in this story, we get a sense that the battle of kingdoms is not equal. Opposites, but not even close to being equal. Now we see here Matthew giving us a picture of God's redemptive process. The eternal king coming and doing everything, everything necessary, everything possible, everything it would take to redeem his people from the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of the evil one, and transporting us to his kingdom, his eternal kingdom. Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter, the events of these few days It's the climax point in the script of human redemption. We've had all this history. It leads up to this weekend. And here's the pinnacle. Here's the tipping point of Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter. And we see it played out in a smaller scene right here in Matthew chapter 8. Let me take you through it so you can see how it connects with our redemption. Number one, these guys could not heal themselves. Self-healing was impossible for them. The demons that possessed them had greater power than they had themselves. They were controlled, they were imprisoned, they were shackled by these demons. They needed outside help. We also need outside help. We have something in us called a sin nature. We're born this way. We're born under the control, the imprisonment, the shackles of sin. There's no way we can be saved by keeping the law. As soon as we sin, we're completely done. In 1 Corinthians 5 and Galatians 5, Paul gives us an example of a lump of dough. He says you can have this lump of dough that has no leaven in it, no yeast, and it'll be unleavened bread until you add leaven. And even just a little bit makes the whole loaf, the whole lump of dough leavened it's no longer able to be unleavened, even with just a little bit. In our Reformed theology, we have a principle called total depravity. That tells us that once we sin, once a little bit of sin enters our being, we are totally corrupted. We are condemned. It doesn't mean we're the worst possible version of ourselves, it just means we're totally polluted, we're totally corrupted. We need outside help, and there's nothing we can do without that outside help to be cleansed. Self-healing is impossible. Number two, Jesus chooses to go to these two guys. He chooses to go where they need him to go. Remember, he had to cross the lake. He's having this great ministry on the north side of the lake, and uh, he's healing people, he's preaching, people are flocking from all over to come and see him, and he says, All right, let's go, let's see, for your perspective, to the southeast side of this lake, there's people over there that need me. So he leaves this great ministry, this fruitful ministry, to go to to where these guys are. You know, there's sick people in Bethsaida, there's blind people, there's lepers in Chorazin, there's people that need help uh, in those cities on the north side, and yet Jesus leaves that and says, those guys need me. Well, it's the same for me and it's the same for you. Jesus looked out over time and said, Mike needs me. I am gonna go where he is. Brad needs me. I am gonna go where he is. Kevin, Justin, they need me. I have to go where they are to help them. And so he does it. He chooses to come where we are. That leads me to the third point, and that is that Jesus is on a very specific mission. Realize when he goes over there, he talks to these two guys, and that's it. He doesn't preach to anyone else. He doesn't heal anyone else. He doesn't try to reason with the town people. He doesn't have a debate. They ask him to leave, and he leaves. That's crazy. That is strange. He crosses this lake. He overcomes a huge storm, probably the doubts of his disciples, their lack of faith, just for these two guys. 
But that's what he did for us too. He had a very specific mission in mind when he died for me and when he died for you. He had our names on his lips, in his mind, a very specific mission when he crossed over time and space to come to this side to take care of our needs. <clears throat> Point number four, no permission was necessary. You know, he didn't ask them if they wanted to be healed. He didn't go ask for advice from the people in the town. He didn't ask the council, the town council, to vote on it. He didn't walk in and say, okay, I'm going to heal two people. Who do you think I should heal? Who are the two most valuable people in this town, in this area? They probably wouldn't have chosen those two guys over in the tombs. So Jesus didn't do that. He didn't come and ask. He just said, those guys need me. I'm going to take care of it. Didn't ask for permission or advice. Thank goodness. Thank goodness he came and met me. And he didn't ask anybody if I was the one that should be healed. He didn't ask anybody if my sins should be forgiven. He just came and did it. You know, I, I ran around with a group of about five or six guys, and if he had shown up in that group and said, I'm going to save one of you, and I was thinking of, it might be Mike, what do you guys think? I guarantee they all would have said, no, no, not him. But Jesus didn't ask. And thank goodness he just came and did what he was going to do. Finally, it brings me to the result. What was the result of this encounter? I think this, this man, uh, these men, were, in Mark and Luke, it's one, probably the one that talked the most or the one that responded the most, maybe the one that was sort of the leader of the two. Uh, their lives were changed. How do I know that? I think they were filled with the Spirit. How do I know that? How, they were sent on a mission. Mark and Luke tell us that they wanted to go with Jesus when he was going to leave. They probably were saying, look, these people don't like us. They say terrible things about us. They don't want us here. We are a, rem a reminder of terrible things to them. Please let us get in the boat and go with you. And Jesus said, no, I want you to return to your home. I want you to tell people where you lived, what the Lord has done for you. They didn't go to seminary. They didn't go to school. They didn't go to Bible classes. They didn't sit at Jesus' feet for a couple years. They just went and did what Jesus asked them to do. Again, how do I know that? Well, we're not told in, uh, in this gospel of Matthew that that's what happened, but we know from Mark and Luke that Jesus sent them out. If you read forward, this is, this is called a spoiler alert, in Matthew chapter 14, Jesus returns to this region. He returns to this land and this area and instead of turning him away, instead of them saying, look, remember last time we said, get out of here? Instead, when Jesus shows up, they start, hey, bring that guy that hurt his leg the other day. Bring those people that are blind. Bring all those, bring everybody. <clears throat> and they rush to Jesus and they start trying to touch his cloak because they want to be healed. Probably because these two people went back and said, here's what Jesus did for me. It had a lasting effect. It had a great effect when they shared their testimony. I think a lot of us are afraid to share our testimony and share about what God has done, that, that Jesus willingly let one of his closest friends betray him, that he let himself be crucified and tortured that he let himself be buried because he knew he was going to rise again so that he could conquer sin and he could conquer death and offer us eternal life. I know in my own life, when I was 17, I gave my life over to Christ. I knelt by my bed one day and I said, Jesus, I want to, I want to live for you now. I want you in my life. And without saying anything, over a few weeks, my friends noticed something different. I hadn't gone to any evangelism classes. I hadn't gone through any training. I just was living differently. And one day, my friend Dave, in front of, all, in front of our group of friends, all of us were gathered somewhere. I don't even, even remember where. He said, 
something's different about you. You've changed. What, what happened? And I had a chance to say, look, I met Jesus, and my life is different, and I like it. None of them bowed down to accept Jesus that day, but it sure made an impact on our, my relationship with them, and it changed our relationships forever. Hopefully they met somebody else who shared Jesus somewhere along the way and they accepted Christ as their savior and were redeemed from the one kingdom and put into the other kingdom just like me. Someday I'll find out. But this story of Jesus healing these two men possessed by demons is a small sliver in the story of the redemptive process that Jesus ushered in with his kingdom. I'm gonna pray right now that this final act, this final scene of redemption makes an impact on you. That you will either, as a believer in Christ, be motivated to go share what Jesus has done for you. Or if you've never encountered Jesus in this way, to ask him to become the King and Lord of your life. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you so much that you willingly allowed yourself to be betrayed by a good friend, that you allowed them to arrest you, that you allowed them to try you, that you allowed them to whip you and crucify you and kill you. And you went through all that knowing that you were gonna rise from the dead, that you were gonna guarantee my personal redemption, that you set in motion that the final act in the story of human redemption. Thank you for your kingdom. Thank you that I know I'm a part of it. Lord, I pray for those who are watching who may have never made that decision. I pray that right now somebody will desire to make you the king and the Lord of their life. We ask this in Jesus' powerful name, amen. Amen. Let's stand in response as we praise our powerful Redeemer. Of heaven, God. 
John 19, 28 through 30. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that the scriptures would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of a hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. 